Hi, we're on our range today, and a lot of viewers have contacted me with different versions of more or less the same question, but recently one viewer contacted me with his own version of this question and a very long, detailed message that made it clear to me exactly what he was talking about. So we're going to take his question and amalgamate it with a few of the other versions of that question that I've heard and turn it all into one big question that we can discuss today. And the big question is this. If you're in the field, and I'll define in a moment what I mean when I say in the field, you're in the field and you're doing a day hike or you're camping or you're hunting or you're fishing, something like that, and all of a sudden bullets start flying past you, how do you tell the difference between A, someone doesn't know you're there and is just carelessly shooting your direction, B, someone does know you're there and they're intentionally shooting your direction, but not trying to hit you, they're just trying to shoot close and maybe scare you or C, they are intentionally trying to shoot you. How do you tell the difference between those and what do you do? And that's what we're going to discuss today. Now, we'll start with what do I mean when I say in the field? Okay. We're on our range, which is a big piece of private property, and you can see that it's forested and we have animals here and so forth. And so when we're talking about building emergency shelters or testing outdoor equipment or fire building, this place can easily simulate field conditions. However, it's private land that's fenced in. Now, it's a fairly big piece of land, but if it were the middle of the night and I got completely lost, as long as I could walk in a more or less straight line, it wouldn't be very long before I hit the fence and I could follow the fence back to where I needed to be. No matter where you are on the property, you're never more than about 300 meters from a public road. And we have a nice cabin here that does not have running water, but it does have electricity. This isn't exactly what I'd call in the field. However, compare that to where I typically hunt jackrabbits. You're about 10 miles from the nearest little crossroads that you could even begin to call a town, about 30 miles from the nearest thing that I would call a town. At any given time, we're three, four, five miles from the nearest paved road, and we're on public land. You see the difference? Where I typically hunt deer, again, about 20 miles from the nearest town, on public land, and at any given time, I'm anywhere from 50 meters to a couple of miles from the nearest paved road. That's what I would call in the field. To be in the field, I don't think we have to go to extremes like being in the wilderness area where unless you have a helicopter, you've had to walk seven miles to get where you are. I don't think we have to go to those extremes, but you see what I mean when I say in the field. Okay, the next thing we have to discuss is the idea that you're out minding your own business and all of a sudden bullets start coming by you. Is that something that really happens? Let's briefly discuss that. So being in the field and having bullets fly by you, is that something that actually happens? And if so, does it happen often enough we really need to discuss it? The answer to both of those questions is yes. Let me give you a scenario. Someone is hunting deer and they're sitting on a log or sitting in their stand and they're eating popcorn, reading comic books, waiting for a deer to come by and all of a sudden they hear a bullet whiz by them and then hear the report of the rifle that shot it. You ask anybody that's been deer hunting for a few years and they will probably have a story similar to that. I can tell you that in my personal life, being in the field, whether it was hunting or camping or what have you, I've had at least three occasions where, either accidentally or intentionally, people have shot really close to me. A while ago, we did a presentation titled, Shot At While Camping, Long Version, where I tell the long version of a tedious anticlimactic story about being in the field, rabbit hunting with a couple of colleagues, when some people just shot at us. The real thing is, though, Look at the comments section on that presentation, and there is a disturbingly high number of comments from people sharing their own anecdotes about when similar things happen to them. Now, we do know that people tell tall tales, but even if a quarter of those stories are true, then being in the field, having bullets shot past you intentionally or accidentally, is something that happens with disturbing frequency. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that someone shooting in your direction intentionally, but not trying to hit you, shooting close to you because they're trying to scare you. Is that something that really happens? Okay. I'm not one to tell other people's anecdotes because sometimes people tell tall tales and sometimes even when people are trying to tell you the straight story, they can't keep their facts straight. 
But in this particular case, I'm going to tell you a story that was told to me by someone whom I trust to tell the truth and keep his facts straight. And the way it goes is, Bob was in an inflatable raft, floating down a relatively slow-moving river, and on one side of the river were some relatively high bluffs, like 50-plus feet tall, and he hears a couple of shots. Looks around and hears somebody up on the bluffs with a rifle that Bob perceived to be a 22. The guy shoots a couple more shots, and Bob can see the bullets making a splash as they hit the water. But as he's going down the river, these bullets are behind him, missing him by like 30 or 40 feet. And he could see the look on the shooter's face, which he described as looking like this. <laughs> the guy was obviously not really trying to shoot Bob. He was just trying to scare him. And so, yeah, things like that do happen. But the question, how can you tell the difference between those those different things of accidental or trying to scare you or actually trying to shoot you. That's going to start with a discussion of what does a bullet sound like as it's going through the air fairly close to you. So I have my A1 platform and I have a 10 shot magazine which is loaded with 5.56 NATO 55 grain full metal jacket spear point and I have my Ruger 1022 and a 10 shot magazine which is loaded with 22 long rifle 36 grain hollow point. And what I'm going to do is set up the camera and then at a distance of about 200 yards from the camera I will fire a string of four shots intentionally missing the camera by about 30 feet four more intentionally missing the camera by about 15 feet, four more missing the camera by, as near as I can, about five feet, and we'll see how that sounds to you. And after I do that with one rifle, I'll change rifles and repeat that drill. And we'll start with the 1022. Now that was pretty interesting. And of course, the audio on our camera has its limitations. And depending on what device you're using to watch me right now, some of you may have more audio limitations than others. So some of you may have heard more than others did. But one thing I'm pretty sure we all heard was the difference in the report of the rifle between the 22 and the 5.56. You could definitely hear a difference. Another thing is, you could hear some impacts, especially with the 22. You could hear the bullets impacting trees. You could hear some ricochets. That's very interesting in itself. But what I really wanted you to hear was the sound the bullet makes as it travels through the air. And it's very common that especially lower velocity rounds will make a hissing sound or a sound like tearing paper. And a lot of times with your higher velocity rounds, you'll hear a sharp crack. And that's the sound you got to be aware of. And sometimes it can be difficult to tell just how far away that is from you. And even when you hear those ricochets or impacts, sometimes those aren't as close as you might think they are. And sometimes when you thought you heard an impact, you really didn't. For example, I was in a situation where somebody that I knew was standing next to a metal post and he heard what he thought was gunfire 
and he was pretty confident that one of those rounds had hit the post right next to him. Okay, two things. One, nothing hit that post. Two, it wasn't even gunfire. It was somebody across the street setting off firecrackers. So sometimes what you think happened and sometimes what really happened can be quite different. But there isn't much mistaking it when you can have a bullet go by you so close that you not only hear it, but you can feel the breeze off of it, yeah. then you know bullets are close to you. If it hits something next to you and maybe chips off some of that bark that hits you, that's pretty obvious as well. So that brings us to the question, how do you know that that's intentional and what do you do? Okay, we can talk about both of those at once. Let's say you're out hunting and today my Henry 22 will stand in for my typical hunting rifle and you hear a shot go off and you can tell by the report of it that it's relatively close to you and you hear a bullet go right by you. Was that or was that not intentional? You know, it probably wasn't. What one thing you can definitely do right away is visual and audio signals that let someone know where you are. Now, in preparation for today's presentation, I did something that I don't typically do, which was watch videos in this format to get some information. And I saw a few videos that weren't intended to be shooting videos. They just became shooting videos, such as a couple of people were just filming themselves fishing and they're on their boat. They're fairly close to the shore, but they're on the boat in the lake. And you hear a gun go off and one of them says something to the effect of that sounded like a 22. Then you hear the gun go off again and you hear the whack of that bullet hitting the boat. And one of the people who's just standing there fishing turns to the direction of the gunfire and starts yelling, hey, hey, you shot at us, we're over here, that kind of thing. And you can hear the shooter say something to the effect of that he didn't shoot at them, he just shot this tree. No, you didn't, you shot our boat. Okay, then you don't hear the shooter anymore because he realized what mistake he'd made and he got out of there. That's a good indication that it was an accident. And the person on the boat, he was waving his arms and yelling, making sure that someone knew that he was there and where he was. There's one thing that I think he should have done differently. Instead of standing there yelling, he should have immediately taken some kind of cover. Now he's on a boat, and unless there was a lot of shots, I wouldn't suggest anything as drastic as jumping overboard. So he didn't have a lot of options, but he could at least crouch down and make himself a smaller target. Now, if I were out in this environment, things I could do would be, one, wear something that makes you a little more visible. Now, in some jurisdictions when you're hunting, you're required to wear a certain amount of orange. So if that's the case, so be it. But if you're in a jurisdiction where it's not required, I'm not saying you should, and I'm not saying you shouldn't wear orange. But I am saying, in terms of someone accidentally shooting your direction, this might reduce the chances of that, and it can make a good visual signal. There's also audio signals. Carry a whistle. In fact, in hunter education class, you learn about carrying a whistle as an audio signal to help you get found. So if someone were to shoot at me right now, I might make audio and visual signals. However, the first thing I would do is get behind some kind of cover and make an audio and visual signal like this. <laughs> hey, 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 or blow my whistle. <sighs> now, I use this tree as an example. This is a fairly good sized tree, and if someone were shooting at you with a 22, it would definitely stop the bullet. Bigger things that people are typically using for hunting, 308, 30-06, 300 wind mag, even a tree that size is not highly effective cover. Now, for more details on that, you can watch our presentation on Using Trees as Cover Part 1 and Kentucky Patriots' presentation on Using Trees as Cover Part 2. But on ground like this, it's uneven enough that if I were taking fire, I could get kind of behind the tree and down in a prone and there's enough contour to this ground that it could give me some defilade. And I would say, definitely do that. Then start making signals, letting people know where you are. Now that brings us to the question of, 
how do you know if it's accidental or intentional? A good way to tell that it's accidental is when you do that, someone says, oh, sorry, or they say, oh, expletive, and you see them run away. <laughs> they want to avoid getting in trouble. Good indication that it's an accident. I'll give you another example. I was on a range that's attached to a public campground, and it's just a public range, and it's a 50-yard range, and I'm parked right on the 50-yard line, and I'm there in a full-size F-150, middle of the day on a very clear day. And I was there to set up for a shoot we were going to have the next day. And I was doing something next to the vehicle when I hear a loud rifle report. Whoa! And I look up. Somebody, you're only supposed to shoot from 50 yards, but he's back at about 150. And he was shooting at whatever was laying on the range. He hadn't set up a target. And he's actually shooting across a good portion of the campground. No, there was no one there. And he's using his hood of his vehicle as a stabilization platform. And he was either so obtuse that he hadn't noticed my vehicle there, or he'd noticed it and just didn't notice I was standing next to it. And when I hear that, I kind of duck, and I go around the pickup and look, and then he sees me, and all of a sudden he looks really sheepishly, oh, and gets back in his vehicle and leaves. Good indication that was accidental. How can you tell if it's intentional? Many things to consider, most of which you're going to have to consider in the matter of just a few seconds. But one thing I would say is, if you're, hey, I'm over here, and someone yells back at you, yeah, I know, and then shoots again, that's a good indication that it was intentional. If you take cover and a couple of shots get close, and then you run up and uh, run away and get behind another tree that's 40 meters away, and the gunfire follows you, that's a good indication that it's intentional. If you yell, hey, I'm over here, and the gunfire ceases, good indication that it's accidental. If the gunfire intensifies, good indication that it's intentional. Also take into consideration what may have happened earlier in the day. For example, and I'm speaking in the hypothetical, you're going to go hunting, you go up to the edge of a nice open area and you're just going to sit there and watch this open area. And a few minutes later, some other people show up and tell you, you can't be there because that's their hunting area. No, this is public land. Anybody can be here. And I got here first. And they want to complain about it. And then finally they decide they can't do anything and then they leave. Ten minutes later, a couple of bullets whiz by your head. Good indication that that was intentional. And you have to take this and many, many other things into consideration. Now, at this point, we have to talk about gunfire is coming in. You make a visual and audio signal, and that doesn't stop anything. What about shooting signal shots? Okay, there's a faction of the population that seems to have what I think is a weird obsession with shooting their guns up in the air. That isn't necessarily a good solution to things. <sighs> One of the things that happens in situations like this, especially if the gunfire was intentional, is that when the police get involved, whoever was shooting at you is going to claim, no, they, they weren't shooting at you. They weren't firing at all. You shot at them. And then when the police ask you about it, and you say, well, yeah, you fired, but just up in the air as a warning. You just admitted that you fired in this. Sometimes shooting your gun up in the air is not necessarily a good idea. Not just because there's bullets going up that have to come back down, but for other reasons as well. And oftentimes when people tell you that you should shoot your gun up in the air, they're giving you advice that comes from a position of terrible ignorance. Now, one thing I will tell you is, if whatever audio signal you're making, like yelling, blowing a whistle, something like that, if it isn't working and you decide you do need to resort to shooting some shots, not at whoever is shooting at you, because it might be accidental, but shooting some shots just to let them know you're there, I would tell you, do not fire up in the air shoot into the ground. There are many different opinions on 
just how dangerous a bullet coming back down can be. But you don't really want to test that the hard way. And there's the thing of when you end up telling whatever law enforcement agent that, yes, you fired, but it was just into the ground. If the police, and this is a big if, if they actually feel like doing a real investigation and you tell them, no, I just shot into the ground right there. No, well, then they can find those bullets and confirm what you're saying. Now, in this situation, you may have to decide, is this gunfire accidental or is it intentional? And then decide on a course of action. And very often you're going to have to make those decisions based on what little information you have right that second. And you have to make that decision possibly in a few seconds. Now, a side note before we continue. What's with the orange camo pattern baseball hat? Okay. The way I understand it is, because it's orange, it makes you visible to other hunters. But a lot of animals, specifically deer, can't see shades of red and orange. So this doesn't stand out to a deer, but the camo pattern does break up your outline. So although this is highly visible to other hunters, as far as deer are concerned, this camo is just as good as this. Now, this baseball hat has this mesh back, so there is no insulation going on. That is not keeping my head warm at all. Also, with the brim right here in front and nothing on the side, it doesn't really protect me from the sun very much. As where a Jones cap like this, because it has a little more on the side, will shield my eyes from direct sunlight. And because it's made to come over my ears, it will protect my ears from the bright sun in the summertime, while in the wintertime, keeping them a little bit warm. I realize this hat looks like something your grandpa had. Grandpa probably did have one of these, but this is a very practical piece of headwear. Now I'm almost done. We've covered things like what kind of sounds bullets make as they travel through the air. We talked about ricocheting. We've talked about just because you think you heard an impact right next to you doesn't necessarily mean it really was right next to you. We've talked about if you're taking fire, taking cover, making visual and audio signals that let somebody know that that's where you are. If you're taking fire and it's just accidentally, that's probably going to resolve it. If it is an intentional shooting, but they're not trying to hit you, they're just trying to shoot close to you and scare you. Okay, now they've scared you, mission accomplished. And again, making visual and audio signals that you're there, probably going to resolve it. But what if it doesn't? What if the fire is intense, bullets are hitting really close to you, you make the decision that this is intentional based on the information you have, and you may have only a few seconds to make that decision, and you come to the conclusion that you are in imminent, that's the one with the I, imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm, and to resolve this, you have to shoot back. There are two things I can tell you. One, you better be right. And two, you better have a significant amount of evidence to back up the conclusion you came to. Now that can conclude today's presentation. Anything I say from here on out is just going to be things that illustrate the point I just made. So you can go ahead and turn this presentation off now. Okay, if you're still here, then this is the part where I have to tell you, one, I'm not really trying to give you any advice. Two, I am not an attorney or a legal scholar. Three, this is not the format to complain about law enforcement. Okay, with that in mind, let me illustrate some of the points I just made. In this format, there's a video presentation and the title is something like Ring Camera uh, Catches Homeowner Shooting His Daughter's Ex-Boyfriend, something like that. And we'll post a link to it. And if we don't, uh, please feel free to post a link. And it's a short video, and I'm going to make it even shorter. Living in this house are a man and his wife, and they look like they're 60 plus. 
And then their daughter, which I couldn't really tell if she was 16, 20, whatever. Daughter's ex-boyfriend comes to the door. And this is an ex that she reported that she hadn't had any contact with in years, except he called her the night before. Okay. Boyfriend rings the doorbell. Ex-boyfriend rings the doorbell. And when you watch this presentation, you've got to listen close. And you hear mom say, she doesn't want to talk to you. <clears throat> well, then boyfriend tries to open the door and you can hear dad inside say something to the effect of, get off my porch, I have a gun. That seems pretty clear. Then ex-boyfriend starts shouldering the door and he does it a few times and he breaks the door open, whereupon the man inside fires three rounds, ex-boyfriend runs back down the sidewalk, sits down and dies. Okay. Now, question, was that homeowner justified in shooting that person? Okay. When you ask that question, you're going to get a lot of very confident, absolute opinions from people who belong to the league of ignorant, pedantic doofuses. Well, you should have heard the word I was going to use, but no, you shouldn't have. Okay. When I look at that video, and there's the debate, was he justified in shooting that? The first thing I have to do is recognize my own ignorance. I don't know what the specifics of the law is in that state. There's also the thing of ex-boyfriend. How ex was he? Now, according to what information went with this, the daughter said she hadn't had any contact with him in years. Yeah, is that true? I don't know. What's the history? Did they break up because he was abusive and beat her up? I don't know. But then we also have to take into consideration things like, if you look at the man that I saw in the video, that is the man who lives here, he looks to me like he's 60 plus and does not look like a particularly fit specimen. And so you really want him to get in a dukeroo with this 25 year old man, he looked 25, that is either so detached from reality that he didn't catch on to get off my porch, I have a gun, or was so determined that he didn't care. Now, something that a lot of people don't understand is if you're someone that has yet to reach your 50th, 55th, 60th birthday, a lot of people don't have an appreciation for just how decrepit some people really are when they hit 60. Now, I don't know that firsthand, but I have associates in that age category that can barely even walk anymore. And so the fact that the guy who lived in this house was, looked like a pretty large man, that doesn't make up for the fact that he's 60 plus and we have no idea what kind of maladies he has. He might have been using all of his strength and vigor just to pull the trigger. So there's a lot of unknowns here, and we have to recognize that when we watch this presentation. Now, from what little I do know just watching that video, to me, it looked like he was justified, and evidently local law enforcement agreed because they didn't indict him. But the most disturbing thing, more disturbing than watching this man who appears to be mentally ill die, more disturbing than that, is the commentary on that presentation. Now, there was a lot of commentary with things like, man, that's terrible that you had to do that, but good thing you did. Uh, that, that he was in no choice, absolutely justified, all that kind of commentary. But there's also a lot of commentary judging this shooter very harshly. Gosh, that kid was unarmed. You had no reason to shoot him. Well, what did he do to you? Broke in the door? And, and the one that was most disturbing, and I hope it was just someone trolling, because if not, it was horrific, is, well, you should have just talked to him. He did talk to him. 
get off my porch, I have a gun. I think that's a pretty clear message. Now, what this really illustrates though is, if you get into a situation like we've been talking about today and you decide that you need to shoot, I guarantee you that your actions will be judged very harshly by people from the league of ignorant, pedantic doofuses. And it's my experience that the less someone knows about a situation, the more eager they are to give you advice or judge your actions. A good example is when we did the presentation shot at while camping long version. There were a lot of people in the commentary who told me that I did everything wrong, you know, imagine that. And one comment that popped up quite a bit was different versions of, I should have pulled out my phone and started filming it so I could document it. Because what I had said was, they're shooting at me, but they didn't actually hit the pickup or hit any of us. I don't have any physical evidence to back up a claim of self-defense if I had shot back at them. And someone said, well, many someones said that I should pull out my phone and document that. That would be good advice if it happened in the last couple of years. This happened long enough ago that it was at a time when it wasn't common that your cellular phone was also a camera. Certainly none of us that were there actually had a camera phone. So you're telling me this is what I should have done while telling me I should have done something that was in no way whatsoever possible at that time in that place. And this is very common of people from the League of Ignorant Pedantic Doofuses. And so in the situation we're talking about, you will be judged by those people. And you will be judged harshly in the media. People that you know, that are your associates, that should know better, will judge you just as harshly. And people will say, well, gosh, I bet it was just a mistake. I bet he wasn't shooting at you intentionally. <sighs> okay. If you were duck hunting and a goose flew over and you mistakenly identified it as a duck and shot it, that goose doesn't get to say, I'm not really dead because, you, because it was a legitimate mistake on your part. When bullets are whizzing within a foot of you and you have to shoot back to resolve it, whether or not that person was really trying to kill you isn't all that relevant. The fact that you find yourself in a position where you think reasonably and prudently, that you are in imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm. That's what's relevant. And you have to be aware that people are going to judge you in that way. You also have to be aware that although the police represent themselves as highly trained professionals, and many of them are, some of them are not. And you may find yourself in a situation where they try to twist and turn the facts in every which way to make it look like you did something wrong, even when they know you didn't. And so, in a situation like that, you have to be right. And you have to have some evidence to back up the fact that you were right. And that might be in short supply. And you must be aware that you will be judged by people from the League of Ignorant Pedantic Doofuses, and that you were, that the actions that you took when you had literally a few seconds to decide on a course of action and execute it, those actions will be critiqued by people who have weeks, months, years to decide on what you should have done. Keep that in mind, and I know that's a lot to keep in mind when bullets are whizzing within a couple of feet of you. So, if you've sat through this entire presentation, thank you for your patience, and I hope this answered some of the questions that you have on this subject. And, by all means, if there are things to add, please do so in the commentary. This is more so than me just lecturing. I think this is a subject that it is really good to have a lot of interaction and discussion about.